Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us uh, today for EMCA's uh, 1821 Revolution and Poetry in Motion panel discussion. Now, the panel discussion is in association with AHEPA's Hellenic Cultural Commission. My name is Luke Katzos, EMCA's president and founder and the chairman of AHEPA's Hellenic Cultural Commission. Our distinguished panel today will include author poet Nicholas Alexiou, Professor of Sociology and Director of the Hellenic American Project at Queens College, poet, essayist, prose writer, translator, and twice president of the Hellenic Authors Society, Yorgos Pulladas, and author translator, Andreas Melas, the former president of Hellenic Link Midwest. This panel discussion will focus on the evolution of Aon, Founded. Professor Nicholas Alexiou will present on the Greek Revolution and American Philhellenic poetry, which will include the poetry of James, uh, James uh, Percival, William Bryant, Lydia Sigourney, and James uh, Brooks, uh, also known as Florio. Yorgos uh, Kulavis will uh, present on Greece, poetry, revolution, and discuss, among other things, what he calls the double headed eagle of modern Greek poetry, namely Solomos and Byron. And Andreas Melas will discuss the poem, The 9th of July, 1821 by Vasilis Michalidis, considered the national poet of Cyprus that he has translated and written about. A poetry, a word from the ancient Hellenic uh, pieces, meant in philosophy, the activity in which a person brings something that did not exist before and etymologically derived from the Hellenic term Pien, which means long history in the Hellenic world and played a very important and pivotal role in the Hellenic revolution and independence, both domestically and abroad. This genre was used to explore and disseminate new political ideas in the period of enlightenment, romanticism, and revolution. In many ways, poetry and revolution are intertwined historically, and certainly they are in the Hellenic Revolution. Uh, this event, among the others we have had this year, and we've had, uh, I don't know, close to 20 events around the anniversary of the Hellenic Revolution, a part of EMCA's American Hellenic Revolution of 1821 Bicentennial Committee series of events, focusing not only on the revolution but also importantly on the American Hellenic diaspora and international aspects and influences of the revolution on this, its 200th anniversary. Welcome gentlemen, and uh, I'd like uh, first to present a, a vice president of, uh, of certainly EMCA, we go back many years, and uh, he has also been with us as a panelist on many different of our pan panel discussions this year. Professor Alexiou was born in Volos, where he studied economics. He has received an MA degree in sociology from Queens College and a PhD in, in the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He has taught in the Department of Sociology at Queens College since 1990 and has received the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching. His fields of interest are social and political sociology, ethnic studies, and research. He has established the first library museum for the Greeks of New York, and he is the director of research of the Hellenic American Project at Queens College. Also, a contemporary poet, he is the author of six books on poetry, and many of his poems have been published in Hellenic and American journals and anthologies. He is a member of the uh, Greek, uh, Greek Authors Association in, in Alas and the uh, Greek American Writers Guild Association in New York. Welcome, uh, uh, Nico. Christo Lou, and uh, I'm, I'm very glad uh, to be here again. And, uh, first of all, congratulations to Enka and, and all, uh, all, all the, the people who support this effort, uh, commemorating throughout the year uh, the, the Greek uh, War of Independence, which was a uh, an event beyond uh, the boundaries of Greece. And, and I think um, um, today's panel, uh, it is, it is a, a, a panel uh, of knowing 
uh, many things about poetry and the value of poetry regarding uh, the revolution, uh, how the language is associated uh, in both countries, in both sides of the Atlantic uh, with uh, revolutionary ideas and, and consciousness. Uh, and, and I'm very pleased, uh, of course, and, and extremely happy uh, to see my, my dear friend and, and colleague uh, and president uh, uh, of, of the uh, Author Association in, in Greece uh, uh, until recently. Um, and of course, the latest thing that he did among the million things he did all these years was to save thousands of books uh, from being destroyed uh, when a publishing house uh, had no other choice but um, to destroy the books. And, and I think this is an extremely important uh, act uh, to save the books. Uh, also, I'm very pleased um, um, regarding our connection with Cyprus because we don't have many chances to communicate with scholars and intellectuals um, in the poetry of Cyprus, which is uh, uh, very important and a long, a long, uh, it has a long tradition. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to, um, for all of us to commemorate uh, uh, the Greek Revolution and of course talk about what we love most, uh, poetry. Um, uh, Costa, uh, if we're ready to start, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start uh, mentioning a few things about uh, the concept uh, of romanticism because this is uh, very, very important. Um, and uh, you see some of the of the figures that we're going to talk about. Of course, the Greek hero uh, Byron, uh, of course, uh, the person who established uh, the Greek state. <laughs> Solomos and his, uh, and his his poetry, Sigourney, Brian, uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, who had an imaginary uh, trip to, to Greece, and uh, that shows the importance of uh, and uh, the influence of Byron to the American uh, uh, poets. So those are some of the figures that we're going to discuss uh, today. Um, next next slide, please, Costa. So as we all know, uh, Romanticism or the Romantic era, uh, it, it was, of course, an artistic, but also a literally musical and intellectual movement started in Europe uh, at the end of the 18th century. Uh, it has variations on how, how we were we standing in, in various, various countries, but nevertheless, it was a very strong uh, uh, movement. Uh, it was inspired uh, absolutely uh, related to the French Revolution, like many other things, uh, the ideals of uh, uh, democracy against monarchy, the participation of people uh, to uh, uh, political decisions, uh, etc. And of course, uh, Hellenism, the concept of, of uh, the ideals of Greece and, and democracy, uh, of uh, um, uh, free uh, exchange of ideas uh, was uh, you know, the, the, the central piece to, to all this, giving uh, an opportunity to marginalized and oppressed uh, uh, societies to promote uh, uh, their uh, demands for uh, equality and democracy. Very good. Uh, in, in our next uh, uh, thing, we see that romanticism uh, had different phases, of course, and generations, starting with the, uh, the early uh, poets, uh, Blake, uh, Baldridge, and uh, Wordsworth, and of course, coming to the uh, heart of, of, of uh, the second generation, Lord Byron is an extremely um, uh, important figure, uh, for, uh, not only for Greece, but also for the States and the movement in general. Other people, it's kids, of course, uh, Shelley, uh, and, and authors, uh, as you can see here. Um, Byron and Solomos, I think uh, the way I see them is like they were the ambassadors of Hellenism and affected um, the sentiment toward the Greek War of Independence on a global scale um, through uh, their poetry. Uh, they inspired fortitude and cultivated solidarity among the Greek uh, people. Costa, uh, moving on, uh, we'll see a few things about Byron, as you know, when he decided to move to Greece uh, in uh, 17, uh, uh, in um, uh, in the early uh, stages of, uh, of the Greek uh, Revolution. But of course, he was writing about Greece before that. Uh, 
and uh, the inspiration uh, he had. Uh, he is uh, the person who, uh, through his poetry and his um, actions also, of course, right, fighting, living Italy and living uh, the, the uh, bohemic life, uh, the, the Bohemia, uh, going to Greece uh, uh, and, and fight. Also, as uh, we know uh, from other uh, events we had with Lou and Emka and, uh, and Hap, is that uh, many uh, American Philhellenes who went to fight uh, in Greece, especially the African American, uh, James Williams, so he, he met Byron and also he, he participated in the, in the Mesology siege and in Exodus. So uh, this is uh, uh, the moment that Byron goes to Greece and creates uh, with his actions uh, and, and his poetry uh, the new uh, conditions, uh, the concept of in, uh, making the Greek case an international case. In uh, the next one, Costa, uh, uh, <clears throat> we'll see most specifically uh, when uh, uh, in August 1823, Byron uh, uh, moved to Greece actually. Um, he, he sold his estate uh, in England. He raised money for the Greek Revolution. Uh, in 24, we have the Byron Brigade of uh, 30 oh, police wow. officers and 200 men. And this uh, controversial figure, Mavrokordatos, uh, you know, a very uh, strong politician, uh, but at the same time, very controversial. He, he was very supportive of uh, the whole movement because he knew uh, um, international politics. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Byron died uh, uh, prematurely uh, in, uh, on April 19th, uh, 1824 in, in Solent. Uh, as you're gonna see, uh, let, let, let's move to the next one. Uh, we, we are familiar with his works, right? The Giaou, the Bridge of uh, Avivus, the Seeds of Glory, Prometheus, uh, the Tide Hearted, the Pignovitz, uh, and, and, and other works. Of course, uh, we have a chance to, to talk about the Isles of Greece today, because I think it is uh, the best known and most often quoted point uh, about Greece. Uh, moving on, Costa, I will see. Um, uh, the relationship with Solomos, uh, who is considered, of course, it is the national poet of Greece. And I know that uh, uh, the uh, will talk about Solomos and his contribution in more, in more depth. But definitely, uh, Solomos also uh, was a person, a poet, an intellectual who uh, uh, developed his thought, his thoughts mainly on his early education outside of Greece. Uh, I'm saying that in order, in order to uh, uh, underline the importance of the Greeks of the, the diaspora at that time, uh, or throughout uh, the time until, until now. Uh, uh, he, he moved from, from writing or thinking in, in, in Italian in different language. He managed to uh, uh, bring his language, his thoughts, and his feelings uh, um, uh, to, to Greece and, 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 and be a part of the whole movement and associate uh, the issue of language with the rebirth of uh, the new uh, nation. Um, the next one, uh, Costa, we, we, we know a uh, few things about it. Of course, be, uh, besides the national anthem, he wrote many other things, extremely, extremely important. And I think uh, some of his lines um, are, uh, you know, they are in, in, in such a way that I think uh, they, they, he's the, the forerunner of surrealism. When he says, um, when I, I heard her eyes uh, in, in, inside my, my heart. So th those are uh, extremely important uh, uh, lines from a person uh, who wrote uh, many years before uh, surrealism, but he, he, he can be uh, he's a po like most uh, great poets, they cannot be categorized as in, in one category. So uh, that was Solomos. And uh, sometimes we have to see him beyond uh, the national anthem. Uh, the next one, uh, Costa, is uh, focusing on the American Philhellenic po uh, poets. Uh, as well know, uh, uh, for what we discussed all these uh, uh, months since, since January, uh, regarding the Greek Revolution, 
uh, we know that uh, it's something we call the Greek fever, and that means uh, the uh, enthusiasm and the uh, support of the people uh, in, in the states, uh, regardless of uh, the position uh, of the government, which is uh, uh, something very similar to what, what happened to other European countries, where the governments were even more uh, strict and authoritarian, uh, the Holy Alliance, uh, um, Metternich, uh, etc., the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, they were strict uh, against the Greek Revolution. Uh, but it's also here uh, in the States, it was uh, the oxymoron between uh, the passionate uh, support of the people and the um, uh, Monroe uh, Doctrine, which was the doctrine uh, uh, given uh, this way out to the American government, not to recognize officially uh, the revolted, uh, uh, the resurgent uh, uh, Greek government, but rather to uh, establish uh, establish a policy uh, of uh, new neutrality. Of course, we know that uh, as strong uh, the Greek fever, the support was, on one hand, also the anti-Greek feeling and sentiment, especially from the business uh, uh, cycles uh, circles uh, was uh, uh, also uh, very very strong, and uh, uh, from uh, from what I I see, uh, regardless regardless that the Philhellenism was defeated uh, in the states, and uh, the non-participation, the non-recognition uh, uh, of the American government prevailed. At least we have uh, the poems of the Philhellen uh, uh, poets. Uh, one uh, of them, uh, it is uh, Lydia uh, Sidurni. Uh, she is a very interesting figure, being a female at that time, and being one of the uh, uh, feminist uh, before of all uh, uh, movements. Uh, she, she took an active interest in philanthropic and educational work pertaining to young women, especially uh, for the injustices uh, faced by Native American persons social uh, uh, reforms and slavery. Um, most of the Philhellenes, uh, either those who actually fought in Greece or those who uh, wrote poems or did uh, other uh, uh, activities uh, in the States, they all had a vision um, um, to, um, for the abolition of slavery and the participation of women uh, uh, in uh, uh, social and political uh, spheres. Uh, Sigourney was a prolific writer. Um, she, she, she published 56 volumes of, uh, and contributed thousands of articles uh, to periodicals uh, and books. Uh, Fichelene, uh, the Fichelene poetry of Lydia uh, Sigourney includes the poems Greece, uh, the martyr of uh, Hio, uh, intellectual wants of Greece, appeal to female education in Greece, and uh, scenes at Athens during the revolution. If you can permit me here, I would like to read a line or two by her, uh, uh, of her poem, Greece. Up, you new world, the eye of Greece is dark, the glory waneth. When she sat enthroned on the Acropolis and heard the lore of Pallas echoing through the academy, so wet the savage with a hundred bow and furtherly uh, sings to. Now in dust she sits, where a sad of heart. She may not skill to read her father's book. So who from her has taught the spirit of Armodius and sat down low at the feet of Socrates and soared high with a feral Plato. Yeah, give the key of knowledge and with gems drawn from the gospel's everlasting mind, pay the long debt of dim uh, philosophy. This is uh, one part of her uh, long poet, uh, poem, Greece. As you know, uh, the, the, the style, uh, or the writing style uh, of that time was the epic poem, so you have endless and endless you know, pages uh, of, of um, uh, written uh, uh, words. So we only uh, read some expert uh, today. Uh, in the in the next in the next uh, uh, um, slide, we're going to see 
What's that? Let, let's move to the next one, please. Yes. Um, Brian, right? William Cullen Bryan, a uh, very important figure, uh, one of the central figures of um, American Philhellenic poetry. Of course, as we all know, he was the editor of the New York Review and editor in chief of the New York uh, Evening Post, a position he held until his death. Uh, the newspaper was a platform uh, through which Brian published on issues including organized labor, the rights of immigrants, the abolition of slavery, etc. Uh, he was a friend uh, of uh, the Hudson River School of Poets, uh, whose aesthetic vision was influenced by romanticism, as we saw earlier. He's considered an American nature poet uh, and journalist, and uh, is included among the group of poets referred to as the, uh, the Fireside Poets. Of course, it, uh, here in Long Island, in New York in general, there are many uh, parks. He donated uh, his estate to, to, to New York, and uh, there it is open to the public uh, most of the months of the year. Uh, however, uh, one of the important things he did um, is that uh, Brian Influence helped establish institutions such as the Central Park, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, the Medical uh, College here, the Philhellenic uh, Poetry of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of his, includes poets like uh, the Massacre of Hio, a tremendous event that influenced um, um, Phil Hellenism uh, about this, uh, how savage was uh, uh, the Turks uh, to, to, to the island, uh, massacring people. So uh, the massacre of, of Hio uh, was an important uh, event. The Greek partisan, the Greek Amazon, uh, and the Greek uh, boy. Uh, from uh, the Greek partisan, I'm going to read a few lines here. Our free flag is dancing in the free mountain air and Gurdon's arms are glared, and warriors gathering there, and fearless in the little grain whose gallant bosom sealed it. The blood that warms their hearts shall stain that banner. Each dark eye is fixed on earth and breathe each solemn greeting. Reap will not be reaped uh, wheat till Wonder hosts are flying, and all their bravest at our feet, like autumn sieves are lying. So this is part of the Greek partisan. Uh, the next uh, uh, poet, I think, is is considered uh, one of the of the uh, you know uh, very uh, strong Philhellenes, uh, Brooks, who also. Uh, prefer to uh, publish his poetry under the, the pen name Florio. Uh, he, he, he moved to New York City at some point. He came uh, across uh, with uh, the Greek fever and, and the, the, the Philhellenic uh, movement. And also he became a literary editor of several journals, including uh, the Minerva Literary Gazette, the Athenium, and the Morning Courier. <coughs> Uh, very important uh, uh, journals and magazines uh, at the time with great influence. That's why it is important to know uh, that these Philhellenic poets also had an uh, important position within the American uh, society. Uh, in addition uh, to all those poets, of course, uh, there are several anonymous poets uh, who wrote extremely beautiful lines but uh, there are no specific names. Uh, that shows um, the collectivity uh, and, and the passion of the American people to, to express themselves uh, uh, through poetry uh, in support of uh, the Greek uh, revolution. Uh, in, in, the, in the next slide, I make a, a comment about Edgar Allan Poe, uh, just uh, in order to show the, uh, how powerful how strong was the influence of, uh, of, uh, of Byron across the Atlantic? Uh, because this is a very little known fact about uh, uh, the great Edgar Allan Poe when he was really young, about 19, 20 years old. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he was so much inspired like Byron, he wanted to, to become Byron, right? And uh, he wrote uh, an imaginary letter of, uh, of an imaginary uh, trip that he also, like Byron, 
uh, you know, tried to go to Greece and fight the Greek Revolution. And of course, she was caught somewhere and then uh, uh, they sent him back. Uh, uh, we see all this in one of his letters that uh, it, uh, it is a, it, in the museum uh, um, where he says, um, I run away, etc. Yes, this is uh, his, his memo. Um, and it is online for all us to see and, and, and you know, uh, feel feel the, the enthusiasm and, 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 the, and, the, and the Byronic uh, fever he had and, and the Philhellenic fever he had um, uh, in the museum of, of, in Virginia, where he says that I want to go to Greece, liberate Greece, be like Byron. It is an amazing how, uh, how poetry across the Atlantic uh, and, and the Philhellenic sentiment, uh, 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 people who supported the Greek cause, uh, they identify uh, their thoughts, their feelings, their writings uh, uh, with Greece and, uh, and Byron. Um, coming, coming to a conclusion, um, uh, uh, this is this is just to to, to keep in mind uh, the importance of the English speaking uh, world and and the and the uh, uh, the chance uh, that uh, the Greek cause had to to be uh, disseminated among the English speaking uh, world. Uh, world. A a as you see uh, from the statistics, a lot of people who, who wrote in English uh, got uh, Nobel Prizes, and all of them somehow are related uh, to Philhellenic, uh, Philhellenic sentiments throughout, uh, throughout uh, the centuries. So Philhellenism uh, or uh, understanding Greece and, and, and also uh, uh, Byron and Solomos, uh, uh, the Greek, the importance of the Greek language, it is embedded in all those uh, Nobel Prize uh, 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 poets and and, uh, and, and uh, artists in, in general. So keep keep in mind uh, the, uh, the 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 chain that comes uh, from centuries back uh, and, until until today. Uh, even uh, the latest one, uh, Louise uh, Plug, the, this American uh, uh, poet who, who received the, the poetry, the Nobel Prize uh, award la la last year, also she has poems related to, uh, to Greece and um, her support uh, to the Greek cause uh, in general. So keep that in mind as, as something to, to have that uh, Greek language, Greek poetry, and Greek, po uh, 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 Greek poetry, uh, uh, romanticism, Hellenism, are directly related until now. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to uh, make uh, the last statement. So we have uh, uh, those things we read, uh, they're online. You can also find it in the newsletter I published uh, in, in May. Uh, you can see all this. Uh, let's go to the, to the next one. Uh, as, a, as a conclusion, we know uh, we celebrated the, the 200 year anniversary uh, and we see that as an excellent opportunity to study the influence on end of the Greek war of independence in both historical and contemporary context. Uh, we try in this, in this presentation to reflect how the two revolutionary movements, the Greek war of independence and the artistic, literally musical and intellectual movement of romanticism mutually inspired each other deeply rooted in the ideals of the Enlightenment, which had uh, its foundation in classical antiquity. Together, I believe that the movements cultivated the global sentiment of Philhellenism in a way that would not have been seen otherwise possible, by setting boundaries uh, through art. Art, I believe, is a political act. Uh, Solomos, Byron, and all the other poets, uh, uh, you know, prove that every, every single day. Um, also, I would like to take this opportunity without, uh, without being uh, impolite, because I would like to express my anger uh, and dismay uh, to, the, to the Greek government at this moment, or to the Greek bureaucracy rather, that denied the entrance uh, of immigrant children uh, and refugees, uh, students who study in Greek schools to enter uh, uh, to enter the archaeological museum uh, yesterday. As an immigrant, as an educator, as a poet, as a Greek citizen, as an American citizen, um, I, I express uh, my, my, my uh, opposition 
to, be, to, 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 to such acts of denying uh, students who study in Greek schools uh, free entrance uh, to the archaeological sites, especially in the year of the 200 year anniversary. Uh, and I think that during this challenging, uh, unprecedented time, art and poetry is a valuable tool of um, uh, introspection and social analysis, as long as we keep discovering the meaning, uh, which always awaits us. In our present liquid modernity, as sociologists argue, art and poetry can help us as individuals and as a collective consciousness to resolve uh, the conflicting demands of our historical circumstances. Thank you very much. Nico, Nico, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for being a revolutionary at the, at the very end of your, of your presentation. And, and certainly, certainly we are with you. Our, our next uh, presenter is uh, Yorgos Gullarias. Uh, he is an, uh, a Hellenic poet, essayist, prose writer, and translator. In 2000, an Academy of Athens Prize for his innovative writing and for his work in its entirety. His, his uh, poetry and translation has been published in leading per periodicals and anthologies, such as the Harvard Review, the Iowa Review, Plowshares, Poetry, World Literature Today, and modern uh, European poets in, in various uh, countries, such as Bulgaria, Croatia, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Lithuania, Romania, Slovenia, uh, Sweden and Turkey, among many other nations. Born in Thessaloniki, he studied uh, at Reed uh, College and at the graduate facility of the New School for Social Research and worked mostly in New York. Well, we want you back in New York, uh, your, your, uh, before returning to Athens uh, from Dublin. Uh, he has worked as a university uh, lecturer, advisor to cultural institutions. He's the correspondent and he was a press counselor at the Hellenic Diplomatic Missions. He has also served twice as the president of the Hellenic Author Society, the principal association of literary writers in the Hellenic Republic. Welcome, Yorgo, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, let me start by thanking everyone who joined us or who will be following us later. Uh, let me thank uh, the, the very distinguished uh, participants in this panel. Uh, my friend uh, Nikos Alexiou, my new friend Andreas Melas, and especially Lou Katsos, president and uh, founder of this uh, remarkable alliance, Eastern Mediterranean uh, Business Culture Alliance, which uh, in collaboration uh, with AHEPA's uh, uh, Hellenic Cultural Commission has put today's event uh, uh, together as part of a series uh, EMCA has organized through its 1821 Bicentennial Committee, uh, 200 years since the time, since the year when uh, we honor uh, the beginning of the Greek Revolution, of the Greek War of Independence uh, in 1821, uh, regardless of which particular date we may choose as the proper historical uh, starting point. And this is something always open uh, to historical uh, discussion. Uh, and I note uh, uh, the comments by Nicholas and Lou and Andreas is coming up later regarding current events. We have a heat wave in Athens. People are not doing too well, uh, but uh, that uh, should not stop us uh, from uh, uh, considering uh, things that are significant. And my motto, I'll borrow my motto, which simply is three words in Greek, a bit longer in translation, stochashu kiarki, reflect, and that should be enough. These are the, this is the motto, the opening of the most significant Republican text uh, that was uh, printed, was published 
in 1806, several years before the onset of the Greek Revolution, called the Liniki Nomarchia, Hellenic Nomarchy, that is the Greek rule of law. And the author is simply, uh, the book is dedicated to Rigas Velestin Lis, the crucial pre-revolutionary figure. And uh, the pamphlet, this is a Republican pamphlet on liberty, justice, and equality is uh, Anonimu to Elinos. In fact, Anonimu is misspelled on the cover of this book. And we just found out today that an Italian researcher is looking into the archives of uh, Tommaso Massi, a printer, a print shop in Livorno, Italy, the third largest city in Tuscany, where apparently this very significant pamphlet was published and which is a leading light in terms of what has been defined as Neo-Hellenic Enlightenment. Stochasu Kierki. And there are three words <clears throat> which I will try to refer to since uh, it will be suggestive and indicative rather than apodictic what I will try to say. Uh, the three words, of course, are Greece, poetry, revolution. And I will start by repeating uh, uh, a bold, possibly provocative statement, which I had made when I was still working in Dublin back in 2009, and has since been available online, etc. that uh, modern Greece is an outcome of poetry. And I will try to refer to how I see this uh, by mentioning these critical, these three critical words and how they're interlinked. Uh, poetry has been historically very significant in Greece. Uh, if we simply consider that it was through Homer, through the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, that Greeks came together as they were separately organized in separate city-states. And it was in fact Aristotle's student, Alexander, who always carried Homer with him in his campaigns following the Persian Wars, the wars to which in the Isles of Greece, that famous poem by Byron, uh, as he imagines, as he sees himself being at ma the marathon, uh, he, uh, that famous line, I dreamt that Greece might still be free uh, while he's looking at that particular site. And we can, of course, discuss later if you wish what these notions of the emergence of the individual, of the emergence of autonomy, for example, as Castoriadis might call it, or what these particular individuations and individualities might conceivably uh, mean, and uh, how these work in that particular context. But you see, poetry, as Lou has already told us from the Greek verb pin and its philosophical allusions, is a creation, is something that is being generated, is something that you make. And as a creation, even though creation always comes out of history, it also has that illusion of creation, which tries to be outstanding, tries to stand outside history, before again it is engulfed by it and goes further. And this is this process. Uh, this dialectic, if you wish, if we recall Heraclitus and those who followed him, uh, because between the one and the many, between what stands out and what is part of a flow, what remains and what goes. And poetry is, uh, is a matrix. Poetry is a source. Because you see, from poetry comes what I call poetry in motion, which is the theater. That's what the theater is. That's why we call, we refer to the tragic poets. And in the times of Alexandria, 
that's when prose comes out of epic poetry. The first novels, before we get the bourgeois novel following Cervantes, uh, Don Quixote, Cervantes, don't forget, uh, lost one of his hands uh, fighting in that naval battle uh, in a sense in support of what Greece might later become. Okay, so we have these literary connections running through the various strands of the story we're trying to build. And in that story, we're trying to recall, uh, we have a, a significant rupture, a significant rupture associated with what are called the Napoleonic Wars. Don't forget, in 1821, 200 years ago is the year when Napoleon Bonaparte died. And it's also the year when John Keats, one of the great stars of romantic poetry and the, the author of the poem, The Grecian Urn and so on. The Grecians, as former President uh, Bush, the younger might say, uh, that uh, those two losses are associated with 1821, which is also the year when two of the major modern novelists, Dostoevsky and Flaubert were born, Russian, friends. With the Napoleonic Wars broke the back of the three major powers. On the one, on the eastern side of the Mediterranean, the Ottoman Empire, on the western side, Spain and the Spanish monarchy, and in the middle side, Venice. The, as a result of the Napoleonic Interregnum, uh, Spain is out, Venice is out, in fact, it is from Venice that the French forces come to Kerkira, to Corfu, uh, in the late 18th century for that brief period of French <coughs> domination of the Eptanese Islands, when someone with the same name, Manzaros Georgios, a proto-presbyter, uh, welcomes them with a copy of Homer's Odyssey telling them they should read it and they should think kindly of the Greek people who might not be able to read it, but that's how they would understand. So you see this in connections, this was Georgios Manzaros welcoming the friends uh, because the Eptanis uh, is not until uh, Otto, Othon is overthrown and a new British inspired from a Danish house in the Hellenic kingdom. Uh, the new king is of course the new dynasty, George. And it is on that occasion when the Eptanese islands become part of Greece. So Solomos, born in Zakynthos, moved to Italy for about 10 years and then back to Zakynthos and then to Corfu, Kerkira is in a diasporic context. And this is the other significant thing we must always keep in mind that the Greek war of independence and the Greek revolution and those who became the leading force through the society of friends, that is through the Philiki Eteria, uh, which is now unfortunately a platea in Kolonaki and uh, its uh, principal creators uh, referred back uh, to how Capodistria spoke badly of them before he joined their cause and gave his life, in a sense, for Greece. He, he referred to them as uh, low-level low merchant clerks, Eleniae Boroipalili, when uh, they first approached him to lead Filikieteria, but uh, he was still the Tsar's, the Russia's foreign minister, and he had other fish to fry, including setting up uh, uh, Switzerland, which would not exist without Capodistrias's intervention uh, to create that new nation in the middle of Europe. Uh, now, uh, we have that sense of the background, of the historical background in which uh, these elements of poetry move, these historical conditions move, and with the period of Napoleonic Wars, when they come to an end, uh, as 
Uh, you see the two aspects, the two faces of Hermes, uh, trade and culture. Greeks tend to be historically very good at that. Uh, through what uh, in later years would be called piracy, they would break the blockade, uh, the English, the British blockade, and uh, that's how many of the islands and many of the ship owners uh, became quite affluent. And some of them, not all of them, some of them were among those leading, uh, uh, we would call them business people today, who gave uh, their resources to the Greek revolution. Okay, so we have to be, we have to see that it was mainly the peasants and those who were involved with the armed bandits, with the Kleftes and Armatoli, mostly in Morias, mostly in the Peloponnese, and to some extent then in Rumeli, in Serea Elada, and other parts, in the islands that provided the informal and later formal navy, and from other parts of the Hellenic world, all the way from Cyprus to Macedonia and other parts that would not become part of what became that very small Hellenic kingdom by 1830, 1832. Uh, but they came in because you see, after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, this is the only thing in common in pre-revolutionary and revolutionary situations that uh, we that historians have come up with. It's not when things get worse. It's not when things get better. Revolutions happen, tend to happen, when things seem to improve and then they go backwards. They go backwards and this creates that sense of disillusionment uh, that can be translated into what are called the subjective conditions, those things that make a political sense of this disillusionment and different forces can come together. Now, these different forces can be from outstanding figures like Karaiskakis and Andruchos and Kolokotronis, but also Fanariots or those aspiring to be Fanariots like Alexandros Mavrokordatos, who when Byron left and I don't need to say much about Byron and Solomos because Nikos has already presented some of the most essential aspects of their biographies. Uh, when Byron left uh, England for good, right? Uh, and never went back. You see, Byron lost his father when he was three years old, grew up in Scotland off the center. When he's around 10, great uncle dies, he gets the title and the estates and they move with his mother to England, near London, goes to Trinity, Cambridge, et cetera, et cetera. And then he goes to Greece in first time to, to Hellenic lands, 1809, 1811. And he, tell, he, he says that himself, Greece made me a poet. This is very significant. And Roderick Beaton is one of the few people who have picked up and emphasized this aspect. Uh, so there is this connection. And then he publishes the first cantos of Child Harold, Child Harold's pilgrimage. And he becomes a celebrity. That's in 1812, uh, if, I'm, if I recall correctly. And he becomes a celebrity. And when he then goes to Greece eventually, where he stays, he arrives in January and he dies in a little after mid-April. April 19th, he dies, he arrives in January. He's in Missolonghi for a very few months. But this whole process of Greece having made him a poet, the Isles of Greece having been published already and having become a rock star for his time with the first cantos, the whole poem much, comes out much later, of Child Harold. It's as if Bob Dylan would take the Nobel money and go fight for the Kurds. I mean, you understand the impact. We have to consider uh, certain uh, senses and sensibilities uh, to recall Jane Austen as well. So Byron goes there, 
but first he goes to Italy where he is with his friends who are already committed to the Hellenic cause, who are his friends, two of the most important intellectuals and writers, uh, literary writers of that period. Shelley, who dies, he drowns in the Italian sea, uh, who is the one who came up with the phrase in his apologia, in his defense of poetry, why we're all Greeks, okay? And Shelley's young wife, Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, who imagines the coming industrial age and uh, the iniquities of what was for them modern life as a Frankenstein. She is the person who wrote Frankenstein and who also wrote a book that partly takes place in Athens, The Last Man. Not many people read it nowadays, but has this also this other significant uh, connection. And so Byron from there goes through that, those other periods uh, and aspects of his life that Nikos Alexiou already referred to in his presentation and ends up in Mesolonghi. And uh, there he is with Mavrokordatos, Alexandros Mavrokordatos, who as a tutor of Greek was the one teaching Shelley and Mary Wollstonecraft Greek when they were in Italy. Do you see how these connections, how these things come together? And Mavrokodatos is the one who is always, of course, fighting. So he's not very popular in that respect uh, with the various military leaders of the revolution. But he also has the kind of diplomatic acumen to suggest to the British foreign secretary that if Britain does not support Greece, then it will naturally lean to the side of Russia. And this is part of how the involvement of Great Britain is assured at that time. And there's of course this constant infighting. There are civil wars and civil conflicts. There is corruption. These are not uh, particular to Greece, I do not think. I lived in New York City for too many years not to think so. Uh, and of course, uh, they all have been uh, described as well as foreseen and envisioned for the future by Thucydides, uh, who, uh, when he was exiled, he had enough time uh, to write uh, the things uh, he was writing about, uh, covering part of the Peloponnesian War, since his book is not completed either. Now, what is very significant in the context of these biographical and poetic biographies is Solomos also loses his father who marries his mother who is his servant. And so he and his brother later head of the Ionian uh, Senate, the uh, very politically involved, Dimitrio Solomos, uh, they become recognized. Solomos and his brother plus the other two siblings from a previous wedding. Uh, and Solomos is also very young and when his mother, even shortly after her much older husband's death gets married again, his tutor takes him to Italy where he stays about 10 years, finishes law school, et cetera, et cetera, a very complex story. And that's where he gets connected with the Italian poets, the Italian intellectuals. Italian radical ideas, the ideas of the enlightenment as now being uh, revived by romanticism. And so when he comes back to Zakynthos and when he meets with Spiridon Tricupis, Tricupis correctly suggests to him what is already in Solomos's mind and tells him, look, uh, you could be a great Italian poet, but the top positions in the Parnassus, in the poetic Parnassus of, Ita of Italy are taken, while in Greece, they're not. And now you have these two uh, outsiders, if you will, Byron, an outsider from Scotland, Solomos, an outsider from the Heptanese via Italy. Uh, they sort of come together in their separate ways. Solomon's much younger, influenced by Byron, obviously, uh, who is an established celebrity because of his work. 
In both of them, Byron's major poem, last poem, Don Juan, Don Juan, however we wish to pronounce it depending on our Castilian or non-Castilian friends, uh, is never completed. Solomos's most important poem, The Free Beseased, Eleutheri Pirurikimene, is also never completed. Let me suggest that this is the fate of revolutions not to be completed. Uh, this is the fate of poetry not to be completed. And this is how the extended revolution is always poetic, poetry is always revolutionary. And you see, the only book, the only collection Solomos ever published in his lifetime was his early premature Italian po poems. That's the only thing he published except for Hymnos in Eleftheria, the Hymn to Liberty, uh, which as a poem, not a poetry collection, uh, was published in Mesolonghi, where was papers being published. There was a print shop, all those crazy Phil Hellenes we should be very uh, proud of. Uh, and it was translated into Italian prose. It had earlier been already translated into French, English, etc. And that's why I have come to call Byron and Solomos uh, the two heads of an eagle, a double headed eagle, to the Kefalon, Seleniki species. You see, uh, coming from Thessaloniki, it's easy for me to recognize double headed eagles the same way I recognize that uh, Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson are the two heads of American poetry. Uh, so I can recognize that, that someone who is, does not write in Greek, but writes about Greece, and someone who learns Greek in order to write in Greek because his principal language was Italian, uh, he becomes the figurehead, the source of Greek poetry. That's what Dionysius Solomos is, complemented by a compatriot, uh, Andreas Calvos, in the brilliant Catharevusa of Andreas Calvos with his Odes and the Lyra earlier, two years earlier, who then disappears and becomes a principal, I think in a girl's school somewhere in the UK and goes the reverse way uh, that Byron did. Because you see Byron, uh, his body was embalmed, but his remains after he died out of that terrible cold in Missolonghi were sent to Westminster Abbey for the poet's corner but Westminster Abbey refused to bury such a radical like Byron. And it was only in 1969, perhaps thanks to the counterculture of those years, that a monument to Byron was finally erected at Westminster Abbey, which somehow connects and shows the simplicity and complexity of these relations uh, between Greece, poetry, revolution. I should put a full stop here uh, if we wish to have a discussion, because I'm very much looking forward to hearing Andreas on, on the National Poet of Cyprus, Michaelidis. Thank you. Thank you, Jorgo, for that. Uh, for that, and we'll come back obviously to some of those uh, some of those issues that you mentioned, because obviously they're extremely important. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Andreas uh, Melas. Uh, he was born and raised in Lemnosos, uh, Cyprus. And he is a USA University educated. He is the author of Three Helene Cypriots and Slaughter Us All and Make Our Blood a River. Uh, as an author, uh, while he was uh, 16 years old, he first came to the United States having won an American scholarship. He has made many presentations about Cyprus to numerous and various organizations. Uh, at Ripon uh, College in, uh, in uh, Wisconsin, he earned an AB degree. And at Northeastern University in Boston, uh, he continued with graduate studies, earning an MS, and then began a PH his PhD studies. And he's had uh, Harvard University graduate training in management. This gave him additional insight into policy, leadership, and uh, and also about leaders such as those covered in his two books. A rigorous uh, Harvard writing course, as well as professional writing experience, uh, helped him prepare for his book endeavors. 
he is in uh, some ways, in many ways, following the footsteps of his father, uh, Tonis Melas, who in his shortened life has published 19 books, but had another 31 ready for publication. Well, welcome, Andres, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a great honor, uh, Lou and uh, Yorgo and Nico, to be with you. Um, after two giants of poetry speak uh, all this time, I don't know what I, I could say, but at least I have a corner in that regard, uh, being from Cyprus and speaking about uh, something from Cyprus. Rosta, may I have the first slide? Thank you again, uh, Lou. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, I'm amazed at all the uh, events you have organized the last uh, months, and I wasn't aware of many of them until uh, Alex uh, Bellinis uh, introduced me to you and to this organization, and certainly congratulations. And uh, the other two uh, participants are uh, certainly giants in their field, and I'm honored uh, to be here. My background is not poetry. My father was a poet, and after he passed away, uh, I decided that wasn't for me. So uh, I went into science, uh, chemistry, uh, physics, and, and those things for many, many years. But I guess there must be something uh, in me. So in the last 10 years since I retired, uh, I gradually got into writing and poetry. Maybe, maybe I can do some justice to it. Uh, let me begin um, with some history. Uh, first, let me also say, I consider myself a Hellene Cypriot, Hellenogyprios. I was born and raised with that attribute. Uh, those days before 74, let's say, that's what we were called. It wasn't, we're not called C just Cypriots, we're Hellenogypri. And that's how I feel. So let me just say that uh, Hellenes uh, settled in Cyprus more than 3,000 years ago. And actually, the, um, the Greek Cypriot language is called Arkadogibriagi. It's a particular version, if you will, from Arcadia. And it survived now 3,000 years uh, despite numerous conquest and conquerors coming by. And I think that speaks for the strength of the Hellenic spirit and culture in Cyprus. The Turks did not come until some 450 years ago. And it took them more than a year to conquer Cyprus at that time. What they also did was to nearly extinguish they were the only ones who managed to only extinguish Greek Hellenism. By the end of the 17th century, there were probably only 30,000 Hellene Cypriots in Cyprus. So there comes uh, 1821. Um, there was still a, a, a lot of Hellenism in Cyprus, yearning to support Greece, the leader, the ethnarch, ethnarchist was Archbishop Kiprianos, who had a particular role to play while being compliant with Turkish demands. He also became a, a member of the Filigia Deria and supported Greece, and also a, a fair number, relatively speaking, of Greek Cypriots participated in the 1821 War of Independence. There was one particular event that, that, that stained uh, that period, and that was the capture and slaughter of the uh, clergy and lady leadership in Cyprus, and which we call July 9, and which is the subject of a poem. You might also want to think a bit that at that time, uh, in Greece, was using the uh, the old uh, Julian calendar. So it was like a day like today, 12 or 13 days earlier than July 9, when those events happened. Costa, next please. There are, there is evidence, there are 
reports of Helene Cyprius volunteers in Greece. I won't go into that, but this photo is a photo of a, uh, the flag that uh, Greek Cypriots carried as they were fighting in, uh, in, in Greece, Mesolongi in particular. And it is now in the Greek War of, uh, Museum in Athens. Next, please. Let me get to um, the poem. The poet is Vasilis or Vasilis Mikhailidis. He came much later. There wasn't any poetry that I know of that was written at that time as it was. There were no uh, Phil Helene's in Cyprus writing poetry, but that wasn't forgotten. Um, greatest poet, Ethnikos uh, Pidis is Kibru, uh, is Vasilis Mikhailidis. He was born in the middle of the century and died in 1917. Next, please. He was born in Lefkonigo, which literally means White House village, in what is occupied uh, from Augusta area, Amohosus area. His, father, his uncle was a religious man. He was a bishop of Gideon, one of the three metropolitans in Cyprus. And they wanted him to become an uh, uh, iconographer, which he did well, but that wasn't him. I, I think it was a poetic spirit there. So he managed to go to Italy to study. He stayed there for a little while, then he returned through Greece. That was 1877, 78. And there was a war that liberated Thessaly and he participated in that. Following that, he returned to Cyprus, but he stayed away from his uncle and he went to Lemeso. His uncle was in Larnaca. He became close to uh, Lemeso Mayo Christodoro Sozos, who was probably the most brilliant, in my view, uh, politicians of Cyprus, at least for the first half of the 19th, uh, 20th century. Uh, Sozos uh, volunteered and died fighting for Greece in 1912 at Bizani, next to Yanina, 1912. One of the uh, effects of that was that uh, uh, Mikhailidis was devastated. He wrote a beautiful poem about losing him. And he, he turned to uh, alcohol and he died a few years later penniless. Next. Reading the poem, which is quite long, I found that, and I believe that uh, Mikhailidis used this particular book, which is Memoirs of the 1812 Tragic Scenes, it was written in 1888 in Alexandria, Egypt, by a Helene Cypriot uh, lawyer, attorney, Iorios Kipiadu. Next. So the poem is not clear exactly when it was written. It was written at the end of the 19th century, but it was published 1911. What is particularly interesting is that um, Mikhailidis chose to use the Cyprus spoken language or lalya, doppio lalya di Skipro. That is unusual because uh, Cyprus language it's not a language, it's not even a dialect. It's a compilation of uh, words starting from Homer through classical Greece, through Hellenistic times and Byzantine times, and then corrupted uh, by influences of its uh, French and Venetian, uh, Turkish and, and even British conquerors. And yet he managed to make poetry out of it he used a 15 syllable iambic meter, not just pentameter, but 15 syllables. And uh, in that uh, meter, the first eight uh, make a statement and then the next seven repeat it. So it can become repetitious, but also very powerful. It consists of uh, 56 10 line standards, 560 lines. Talking about poetry and creativity, this is where Vasilis Mikhailidis comes to life because the events, all that he writes are not documented. 
uh, anywhere, and yet they become very real and uh, very, very emotional. It, it really touches people. The, the events take place inside the walled city of Nicosia. At that time, Nicosia was a walled city, a fortress. There are three protagonists, Archbishop Kiprianos, Kyoroglu, who nobody really knows who he was, and uh, Mikhailidis just called that he had a, a, a very good heart. And then the Turkish governor, Kuchuk Mehmet, who was probably uh, an impersonation of evil, uh, at least was. Um, in this poem, uh, Romni and Romiosini refer to Greeks. Those time, Hellenes was not the dominant word for us. It was Romni. And um, I had known parts of this poem ever since I was a child, but I, Okay, it was great. Some of the lines, there were defiance, there was beauty, there was messages in there, but that was it. And uh, so, uh, next uh, line, please. So I was moved to translate it into English because I thought there was a, a great gap in the knowledge of uh, Cyprus, Hellenic Cyprus and the events. And I decided to change the title a bit because the title by Mikhailidis is the 9th of July, 1821. I thought a stronger uh, title may make more sense. So I called this Slaughter Is All and Make a Bloody River. And even a river, I changed it. The original word was Avlagi, conduit. But I thought it wouldn't make sense. I was reminded by the great uh, English uh, historian Ransima, who wrote about rivers of blood in Constantinople, 1453. And that made me think of that uh, parallel. Next, please. Here's what it is. I'm, I'm indebted to various uh, colleagues and, and friends uh, because I, I can tell you, especially having lived uh, away 50 years, uh, I forgot some of my uh, Cypriot Greek, so I needed some help. I got it. I got some help from uh, Gula and Ed uh, Kenny, uh, from uh, Antonios Kostantinidis, a historian and ed educator, Banayoris de Levandos, who is also an educator and a theologian, and my good friend Alexander Bellinis. Next, please. Well, we're talking about this poem, uh, the plot is, is complicated, so let me try to explain it a bit. It begins with secret winds. Is it possible to have secret winds? I don't know, secret to us, but he calls them grifi anem, it's the they, they begin, they gather in Turkey and they bring the summer storm, the carnage that was to follow. And then he delves into Archbishop Kiprianos' predicament. We know from other historical evidence that uh, Kiprianos was warned that his end was coming, that he would be uh, killed. So Kiprianos was thinking, do I go or do I stay? And he was uh, committed to staying because he felt that if he left, uh, the whole island Greeks would be annihilated. And all this comes through with Kyoroglu. We don't know who he was. Uh, in the Kipiadu book, I saw a note that indicated he was the Janissary leader of the Nicosia garrison. And there's evidence that he was something, some person like that, he was a Janissary, he had been inducted, taken perhaps by force into the Turkish Janissary forces, but he kept his good heart and his uh, obligation in any way to his fellow Greeks. Then there is Kuchuk Mehmet, the Ottoman Turkish governor who arrived there like a year earlier, and he was hell bent 
to carry out the Sultan's order, which he manipulated by, pre by presenting minor incriminating uh, evidence that would uh, justify a slaughter of 500 uh, people. And then there was Dimitri the shepherd, who was a, a naive shepherd that Kuchuk Mehmet manipulated to sign uh, a, uh, a letter that he had heard the Greeks and the archbishop and all those people to uh, start a revolution. There was no such a thing. What is also amazing in this poem, again, I think it's part of uh, Mikhailidis' uh, poetry uh, genius, is that he puts Turkish officials coming in, offering uh, to Archbishop to escape. There's no such evidence that I know of that anything, anything, anything like that happened. Again, that, that may present um, his objectivity, his good feelings. My experience is that those days, uh, Greek and Turkish Cypriots got along quite well. The, there was no animosity like it's presented now. And, and then there was a final agreement uh, between uh, Archbishop Kiprianos and Kuchuk Mehmet. And then the uh, executions begin and, and the harrowing. Next, please. It's easier for me um, to read it in Greek or, or Cypriot, but I translate it so that more people uh, hopefully will understand and will sympathize. Initially, Kyoro uh, in the middle of the night comes to Archbishop uh, Kiprianos' bed and tells him that he should escape. And, and after some thinking, uh, the Archbishop says to him, better to shed the bishop's blood instead of so many others. Uh, Mikhail is writing in Cypriot Greek, if I may, parato yemandus polus in Galian to Biscobo, or in Limodiki, parato yemandus polus galitera e galisto to Episcopo. So, then we continue again with the terrible things that the Turkish governor was saying. I have an important order here from the high sea, from the port. The wealthy Romews, the leaders of this land, to gather them all and execute them immediately. Not to spare even one, not even a bishop, to put them all to death any way I choose. That's what he did. Next. Then it was the turn for Archbishop Kibrianos, who had been arrested. So he hears uh, Kuchuk speak. I made up my mind, Bishop, to slaughter and to hang. And if I could, I would kill Oromus in Cyprus. And even more, if I could go all over the whole world, I would slaughter Oromus, not leave one alive. Can you imagine if we heard that today? that anyone would want to kill all of the Romi, all of the Hellenes all over the world. Possibly that never happened, but it is certainly very dramatic. Next, Costa. Here, here it is at the Sarayan, who was the, actually the French king's palace that was taken over by the Turks. And Gibrianos is giving his response. Next. The Romnesini is as old as creation. No one has managed to eliminate us. No one, because my God is protecting us from on high. Romeo Sini will vanish only when the whole world comes to the end. Next. Then Kibrianos continues, or maybe let's just say Mihailidis. Slaughter us all and make our blood a river. Slaughter all our people and kill their Romeo like goats. But beware. When the aging poplar is cut, 300 seedlings spread around it. The plow and bolt and as it tills, feels it is indestructible, but it's always the plow that is worn, the plow that is ruined. The following in Cypriot Greek is, is what we growing up have always heard. Donin and Dandana, Troide, Yithar, Kede, Mabanta, Gin, and Droide, Chijin, Next. 
Next. Then the uh, further down, the Turkish governor says some profound things. He says, over here, Cyprus, these people are very far away. Months pass until they hear what happened elsewhere. And even more, they're surrounded by Turkey. Greeks here like lambs in a far away and secluded barn. Not much has changed. These days we get a lot of information right away, but we're still surrounded by Turkey. Next. Then towards the end, the archbishop lifted up his eyes towards heaven and his eyes appeared to cry. It seemed his soul was hurting from deep inside. I'm sorry. Next. What's that? I'm sorry, oh, there it goes, okay. The end result, oh, internet connections demo. 480 clergy and lady were executed and their properties confiscated by Turkish officials. One of the reasons that they obtained such an order from the Sultan to execute was to confiscate properties. Uh, Cyprus remained uh, under Ottoman Turkish control until 1878 when it was taken over by Britain. The struggle by Hellenic Cypriots to unite with modern Hellas continued. It is worthwhile to note, even from the time of Rigas Ferreos, there were Greek Cypriots who participated and fought for modern Hellas. Next. This other book was a, uh, another inspiration. It started when in Boston, we had the Boston Marathon bomb explosions and the killings. At that time, uh, I felt connected because uh, a person I knew was the 1946 Boston Marathon winner, Stelios Kilianos Kiriakidis. And I thought he embodied the spirit of the marathon so much that we, we could not allow it to die. Next. So again, going into Cyprus uh, history, um, un unfinished business, if you will. 1950s, we had the war of independence from British rule. Uh, the Turks, unfortunately, committed uh, various atrocities, not well known. 1960s, the Turkish Cypriots with guidance from Turkey uh, started a rebellion and split. 1970s, we had the Turkish 1974 invasion with ethnic cleansing. Can, you, can we talk about ethnic cleansing today as being acceptable? No, but it is there, it persists. There have been intercommunal discussions that were not successful. The Turks are not willing to compromise. And even now in the 21st century, the finding of hydrocarbons around Cyprus started a new source of Turkish aggression. Next, Costa. So again, you might ask, what connection do I have with Vasilis Mikhailidis? Well, this uh, bust of his is only uh, 100 yards from where I was born and raised. There's a small park there. I passed by there many times when I was a child. And the street parallel to our, my, my street where I was born is Salonikis, and the parallel one is Vasilis Mikhailidis. So it was there for me all along. I didn't always see it until recently though. And finally, Costa, who don't forget. That's the only thing we can do at this time. We cannot 
fight the tax, but we will not forget. Thank you very much. Thank, 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 you, thank you so much, Andrea, for, for that. Um, it, was, it was very interesting. And I'm, I'm very glad, as I indicated, that I included Cyprus in this particular discussion because it's, it's very rarely that people speak about Cyprus and its linkage to the uh, Hellenic Revolution. Obviously, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you so much for all the presentations. And, I, and you know, quite frankly, as all of you were speaking, there were different things going through my mind based on the different, on the different discussions. Uh, many people may not realize, but um, if not for, let's say, Byron, actually going to Greece, dying in Greece, um, and as was indicated by Yorgo, being the superstar, the superstar of that particular age, the Hellenic Revolution probably would have turned out, uh, you know, very differently because news was coming back, obviously, to various nations throughout the world when the revolution broke out, that uh, wars that were taking place during that time period, that in many cases when America and other countries uh, sent supplies, that the supplies were taken by some of the clefts, etc., and they weren't distributed uh, to, uh, to the people. So, so certainly uh, his, uh, his uh, prominence uh, certainly helped it. And, and again, when, when we think about uh, Elas, when we think about uh, you know, Greece, we cannot but think that in fact, the revolution and poetry are, are extremely interlinked. When Yorgo was speaking about uh, the French uh, being, being in the Ionian Islands, for example, I, I, Quite honestly, the first thing that, that came to my mind was that brief period that Yorgo you know, spoke about. I think uh, Yorgo was about uh, 1797 uh, when the French actually took over uh, Venice and took over, obviously, uh, the Ionian Islands. And uh, for those who don't know, but I think it's important that I'm French. For those who don't know, uh, Colocotronis, don't forget, and a lot of the other clefts uh, had to flee, had to flee uh, the, uh, the Moria. They had to go into the Ionian Islands because there was a firman that came from the Sultan that uh, they, were chased, they were chased out. And if they didn't leave, they would actually die. But what many people do not know is that Colocotronis, when the French were, were, uh, took over uh, the Ionian Islands, that he had actually attempted to send a message uh, for the French to join to join with uh, with him and the Muslims of the Moria to actually create a new a new nation that would have equal representation between the uh, the uh, Orthodox and and the Muslims. In this particular case, obviously, uh, it had to do with his linkage to uh, uh, Alif Thermaki, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, who he had gone back and actually saved from the from the artists when he had the Castro uh, in the Moria. So that's one thing that, that in my mind stands out. The other thing that stands out and it relates to America and what uh, what um, uh, Nico was talking about uh, in terms of Americans leaving the United States and going and fighting. Many people again don't recognize or, or don't understand that uh, Samuel Gridley Howe who was probably the most prominent, the most prominent American who went and fought, left the university after he graduated with his medical degree and went to Greece because, because, because uh, his, 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 famous, his famous poet, the person that he loved, uh, Lord Byron, was, was was after he went to Greece. It, he would not have gone to Greece. Samuel Gridley Howe would not have gone <laughs> to Greece if it wasn't, in fact, it wasn't a fact for uh, for the poet. The other thing, the other thing, again, going back to uh, to some of the discussions on the American poets and what uh, Nuko had talked about in terms of the Greek committees in the United States, and people involved hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Not only did they raise money, but as Nuko indicated, it created it created a, a, a gathering together to discuss the revolution. Now. I'm not exactly sure, and I don't know this individual, but, but there is a Professor Byron uh, Razis. I don't know if any of you know him. Uh, yes. from, from the University of Athens, 
who in fact wrote wrote uh, wrote a, a, a there wasn't a paper I maybe a book where he had it was probably about two hundred pages where he had literally dozens and dozens and dozens of American writers of that period from these Greek committees in many cases that that discussed the revolution. We're talking about not one, two, three, five people. We're talking about dozens and dozens of people who are actually involved in writing in the United States uh, about the revolution. So uh, another couple of points, because I have to mention these, we, we can have an open dialogue. I like uh, when Yorgo mentioned uh, into Greece and, you know, when people talk about you had the French, you had the, you know, the British, you had the Russians, they came in there and, you know, they did what they ever, whatever, whatever they did in Avarino. Uh, uh, Yon was actually uh, uh, correct. It was, they were worried about Russia and they were worried about, uh, you know, Russian influence. And I, and I will say that, uh, Yorgo, another thing, another reason why the British went into, into the Greek areas also is a lot of money was, was uh, given to, uh, to the Greek fighters, etc. And, uh, and in fact, if they had lost the revolution, the stock exchange of, of the British stock exchange would have had a serious problem in, in that particular area. So the concept of obviously the Filiki Eteria, the concept again of the Ionian Islands being the diaspora, okay, because we've mentioned that also in our past, uh, uh, in our past discussions, uh, all intertwined. You cannot, you cannot have had a successful revolution in my mind and certainly based on the discussion you know, we had today without oh, the poetry, and, and you guys can speak about it. poetry was not only of the higher nature of the intellectuals, but poetry was also in the, in, the, uh, in the folk songs that people sang. These were very important you know, to people who in many cases could not read at all. It, a lot of it was oral transmission of poetry and things of that nature. So. I'm going to keep quiet and keep silent uh, to a certain degree. I don't know who wants to respond to anything I said, but or or to anything else. But please, let's have an open dialogue. Anyone? Nico. Nah, nah. Um, no, I mean uh, Lou brought in uh, and elaborated on very and many significant issues, but let me first say how tasked I was by Andreas's presentation. And uh, I, I wish I could have uh, the Mikhailidis poem uh, be in its original uh, Greek Cypriot version, uh, which sounds beautiful to me from the few lines you read and I, you uh, spoke and I saw on the screen. Uh, Secondly, uh, with uh, the limitations of Shelter Island, because we kept losing Lou through part of his... Uh, uh, this uh, gives to me the sense uh, the, that uh, the, his intervention was very useful because it was like poetry. Because poetry is polysemantic, and uh, sometimes we don't quite hear everything that is being said, so we have to fill the blanks. And uh, this is how uh, we are called to participate because uh, the way I look at poetry and literature in general is I look at it as I look at a musical score. Someone has to play the music and the person who plays the music is the reader or the person who is listening to what is being uh, spoken out loud. Uh, so this is... This is part of the, the, the procedures of, of, of language, of literature, and of history. Uh, that uh, we get, we go in there with our intentions uh, as authors of our own uh, future, we think, which is correct, but not entirely correct. Uh, because yes, we do make our future, we do make uh, what comes next happen, but only within given context and given circumstances. And this is the other aspect. How do we not become enslaved by circumstances and how we do not get completely off track 
simply by our wishes that do not take into account what is the context. Uh, it seems to me, for example, that on the one hand, on that imp the important uh, battle of Navarino, right? Without it, uh, Ibrahim's job in the in Morias in the Peloponnese might had finished off the revolution. But without the resilience of those fighters, of the women who kept everyone alive when they would go up into the mountains, uh, the whole populations who survived that incredible onslaught as in other parts of what eventually became Greece, uh, without that resilience, uh, no naval battle, no intervention by foreign forces would have accounted, would have amounted to anything because there would be nothing to be saved. So this is a combination of aspects and forces. Uh, you need on the one hand, uh, the foresight and acumen and uh, especially resilience, uh, how you pull through, because if something remains, uh, you hold on to it, then uh, with outside resources, you can possibly equalize things, right? Because many other things were happening during that period. Don't forget uh, in uh, Constantinople, as Istanbul was called at that time, both words are Greek, so it doesn't matter to me. Uh, my, some of my friends forget that, both Greeks and Turks. Istanbul is a completely Greek word. Uh, uh, etymologically, uh, there was the slaughter of the Janissaries in 1826 during the Greek War of Independence. Very significant. They had taken enough power on their own, and uh, the high port uh, did away with them. In terms of, so you see, uh, the Ottoman Empire was in a constant crisis. Uh, since before the time of Napoleon, and that became the so-called distant question. Uh, and this is also what those who have neo-Ottoman ambitions uh, seem, seem to forget. Uh, so there's these various connections at work, and there's also these issues of, of, of poetry. And because poetry is both uh, something that is has a universal aspect. It's an engagement. It's an engagement with language that through translation can speak to others who do not know that language. But the way it is cultivated, the way it grows, it's within the context of a language. It's like any kind of cultivation. Uh, poets, writers are perhaps nomadic by nature, but what they have to do is be stick to the ground where their stuff grows. And there's no other way to do that but by cultivating it and cultivating it within the particular linguistic context or context may conceivably in some cases be more than one in which they work. And these are also some of the other aspects we must uh, be taking into account. The, 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 the other thing to take into account, because uh, you had mentioned Child Harold, mm -hmm. and, the other, and the other thing to take into account is obviously Ali Pasha of, of Yanana. Without, without, without Ali Pasha of Yanana, quite frankly, and without the, uh, the Turkish uh, the armies the going towards, going towards Yanana, mm -hmm. especially with uh, Kurshid Pasha of the Moria, mm -hmm. who left to fight, uh, the revolution wouldn't have uh, it wouldn't have Would started have the way been. it did, because yeah. the the Filiki Eteria, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. understanding that the armies were uh, uh, and Kurshid was obviously the Filiki Eteria, which at that time was uh, controlled by Panayotis Sekeris, uh, decided <laughs> this was the time to move. If we didn't uh -huh. move right now, we could blow the whole thing. Yes, without it, there would be no possibility because that were the options that were opening up. 
And these are the issues of how you bring in together the various aspects, because you also have to take into account that the debate regarding the revolution, regarding the war for independence, uh, there was also that aspect, that view, that thought that uh, uh, Christian Greeks could become, continue as an elite force within new arrangements within the Ottoman context. So there was also that aspect which influenced uh, members of the Fanariot class and members of the higher clergy. And uh, so th this was part of the debate as to how you proceed. Before they were the first, before there was, before they could no longer go back. Okay. And in fact, some of, of the early atrocities uh, for which our side the side of our predecessors was responsible, was a way to force others to commit themselves because they would be the mercy of reprisals. So do you see this is the complexity and the horror of wars that you always have to deal with when you look at historical situations of this kind. No, certainly. Certainly you saw that in Tripolitsa, certainly you saw that in Monavasa. Yes, yes. That's, certainly you saw that's, it in that's Corinth. What I yeah, yeah, and Nico, Nico, uh, to your to your thing that uh, to your uh, comment that uh, the Americans were with the uh, with the revolution, but not the government. Uh, you know that made me think, obviously, of, of of some of the reasons. It was not only the doctrine, obviously, uh, even though people, but it was also had to do with the had to do with the opium trade between, between mm -hmm. uh, the United States and, and, and their merchants who are buying opium uh, through the Ottoman Empire and selling it into uh, China for four times the price. So there's all types of interconnections. Yes, yes, N yes. Nico, uh, tell us a little bit more about, about, uh, about some of the things that we've talked about in terms of the Philhellenic movement within the US. Yes, uh, uh, before we go there, uh, I would like, uh, to say that it was totally taken from uh, the presentations uh, uh, by Yorgos uh, and Andrea, uh, extremely important uh, presentations and uh, food of thought. And um, I would like to, uh, from Yorgos, I would like to keep uh, how he started, uh, the Stochasu, Stochasu, uh, uh, which is extremely important, especially uh, the 200 year anniversary is a great opportunity to, to, to think to think again about uh, Greece throughout uh, the centuries and how uh, we can uh, uh, redefine our, our position within uh, the, 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 the world between, uh, in the Balkans in Europe uh, etc and also uh, what Andrea said that I am Elinokypriot, something that they try to remove from us. But I, I, I want to keep on that, and especially issues of identity, especially for us who live in, in, the, in the diaspora is extremely important because I want to see how uh, the Greeks abroad, uh, how homogenia, uh, how the, 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 the new generation of, of Greek Americans uh, can hold on some kind of, of identity. And if uh, uh, the revolution uh, the struggle, uh, the language and poetry uh, can, can help into this. Don't forget that we live in a community here uh, in New York, but we don't have one bookstore. We have a lot of businesses, we have a lot of investors, we have a lot of smart people, uh, but we don't have one bookstore. And uh, the total uh, absence of uh, uh, the, the university youth of Greek Americans, who are brilliant, uh, in what they do. But as far as concerned, uh, their uh, presence within uh, the matters uh, of, of the community is totally absent, or at least uh, it's blocked. I don't know how to uh, uh, pinpoint it, but uh, at least they are kept uh, behind. And I think this is the moment, but what you said, to think about it, and then you can do something about it. And, and what Andrea said about identities. And of course, 
Greece and, and, and the poetry of Byron and all this, we saw uh, throughout uh, the years the cultural appropriation by the Europeans of Greek culture and Greek identity and serving back to Greece that this is how we should be. Either this is um, um, uh, the, 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 the Parthenon marbles or this is the, 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 the people who control uh, the European banks, uh, the German alliance. Uh, Greece went through 10 years of severe austerity uh, by our allies. Uh, uh, Cyprus still remains uh, in, in, this, in this condition uh, all these centuries. And if we, if we connect all this, we need to stochastume uh, what is our position and what uh, uh, can we do as, as, uh, as Greeks. And I do believe uh, what uh, you, you read in that line, that if I, can, if I could kill all Greeks, I could do that. Yes, uh, Andrea said, I don't believe that this is possible today. No, it is possible today. Yes, uh, it cannot only necessarily be uh, uh, through through guns, uh, but also through the banks. And we see that that um, that that uh, uh, Greece went through that and still goes. So uh, the elimination <laughs> of of, of Romy that we, uh, in that line, it is possible. It is possible. Well, we we have the hundredth anniversary of the burning of Smyrna coming up next year. Okay, in uh, 2022, uh, we've seen we've seen the uh, Istanbul program in uh, 1955. There is no doubt that at every stage there was a discussion of extermination. For example, in 1770, with the Orlov Rebellion, the Sultan had wanted to exterminate the Hellenic population, quite frankly, but he was told by by the uh, Capitan Pasha that if, uh, Sultan, if you exterminate them, who's gonna pay the taxes? <laughs> who's, gonna, who's gonna pay the taxes in the Moria? Go, going to Cyprus, I will say one thing, that in my mind, the, the people of Cyprus, uh, Helene, or what we call Turks, because many of them were not Turkish DNA. They were basically Helenes who had become uh, Muslims. But, but whether they were Greeks or Turks, uh, the way people define it, they had no problems with each other. The real problem had to do with, I hate to say this, the concept of enosis, which the British did not want. And they created the issue within the populations of hatred that could, quite frankly led to all these different issues that took place uh, later on. And, uh, and it's it's very unfortunate, and and I'm so I'm so happy. And if you can, Andrea, say a few words. I am so happy that we're discussing Cyprus today, because Cyprus, for me, the Cypriots are alienness. They could be in Cyprus. They are Cypriots. There's no doubt about it. But they are alienness, and we should never forget that, Andrea. Uh, exactly. Um, you must alienness. There's no question about it. And even for those who want to say we're, we're Cypriots, it's not any different than saying, you must have Gritigi, you must have Peloponnesi. That is all. Uh, when you're Yorkers, when you're Yorkers, we can say we're when New Yorkers. Yorkers, we're Bostonians. It's not any different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it is true that uh, the British did us a, a great disservice uh, by fomenting separate identities for Greek Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots. If you look at the history, uh, when Britain, British Empire took over, they called Cypriot Greeks and Cypriot Turks as inhabiting Cyprus. Then after Cyprus in 1925 became a crown colony, that's when they switched the words and we became Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. Meaning we belong to Cyprus because Cyprus became a crown colony, okay? And the major reason that we perhaps have not realized or understood is that the British consider 
keeping Cyprus in trouble, keeping it under control amounts to them having their freedom and their rights. Okay, they, um, they put up the, uh, the Suez Canal and they deserve to have the, the, the shipping rights and all that. But why should Cyprus and Cypriots not have the right of self-determination, a basic human right? What people may not realize is that Greek Cypriots, even Turkish Cypriots, signed a demand for NOCs for self-determination in the 1950 referendum. And yet the British did not want to acknowledge it. All those uh, signed um, volumes went to the United Nations. Again, the British did all they could not to allow uh, a vote in the United Nations for self-determination for Cyprus, uh, unheard of. Then came the decision to have a military confrontation with the British. It wasn't that the Cypriots are emoharis and they want to kill all the British or all the Turks, nothing like that. We just want a basic human rights like everybody else. And, and having now forced uh, Cyprus into two parts with the force of 40,000 Turkish soldiers, 300 tanks, and, and now with all the drone power they've got, we don't have a, a chance. Even Greece itself has to really rearm and try very hard to put up with uh, the modern Turkish machine. So what do we do? We hang on. And maybe the United States. Well, will come what, what do we do? Because my, my opinion is that that's the only country that I can wouldn't, do something. I, I, I wouldn't wait. I wouldn't wait for the United States to come through, quite frankly, because this issue that goes back to the opium trade has not changed business-wise into the 21st century. Uh, we're going to wrap it up now. I, I I think this was a fascinating discussion that I'd like to continue, obviously, in the future. If we can, uh, each one of you say some final words. You, you, you were all fantastic. And I hate even stopping this. Uh, Nico, if you can, first, some final words. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you again. Uh, con congratulations to, to, to the, to the co-panelists. It was a, a very important uh, event. And I always uh, learn something uh, from uh, meetings uh, like, like this one. Uh, and. and um, uh, it is up to us, it is uh, what Yorgo said, uh, the revolution, uh, like poetry, it is unfinished. So it is up to us to put just a little bit more uh, towards the, to the completion. So uh, I hope by writing poetry, by, by doing events, by being more inclusive, uh, will add or they move towards to the uh, completion of the unfinished revolution. In a few days, we're going to celebrate the 4th of July, which is another unfinished revolution. In the case of African-Americans, uh, the Jewish question, the, the women's question, etc. So we see that uh, there are many um, uh, similarities, uh, although there are differences between um, um, our American side and the Greek side. Um, but as far as as concerned that the two unfinished revolutions, uh, it is uh, uh, our chance to contribute to it. And, and, and I'm glad that we did that today. Thank you, Nico. Yorgo? Um, in connection uh, with uh, Cyprus, uh, my heart goes out to Ireland and what is going on with Brexit and Northern Ireland, the divided part. And uh, on... Uh, next year's anniversary of uh, uh, Smyrna, etc., is the anniversary of the Irish Civil War. And I'll stop with that, number one. Number two, my heart goes out to Haiti as it was the first country to recognize the Greek Revolution, the Greek War of Independence. And even though the, that boat that was uh, bringing people to fight with the Greeks uh, as well as uh, some supplies did not make it across the Atlantic. Uh, we should be cognizant of that. 
especially in the United States, it seems uh, to me. And thirdly, I think we should hold on to what I call realism of the imagination, uh, because realism is not what we cannot imagine. Realism also is what we can imagine. And the realism of the imagination is a significant motor in poetry, as well as in life, as well as in politics, as well as in society. And thank you all, Lou, Nikos, Andreas, Kostas, everyone, all those involved in making uh, today's discussion possible. Thank, thank you, Yorgo. Hopefully we'll, we will find out where the, ton, the 10 tons of coffee and those soldiers yes. and those soldiers yes. under- Yes, and, someone and, is and, awake in the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will say that the United States did not recognize the uh, country of Elas uh, or Greece until after, after they had their independence. And mm -hmm. the first representative did not land in Athens until I think the 1860s. Uh, Andrea. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm deeply honored, uh, such a distinguished uh, panel with uh, Nico and Yorgo and, and, and Lou, thank you so much. Um, great opportunity for me, and uh, we just never forget. Next I, uh, <laughs> th thank you all for a wonderful, uh, for a wonderful uh, session here, panel discussion. I will say just a couple of things, uh, you know, that were mentioned. I saw on the blackboard that, uh, or on the board, you know, Solomos' mother was uh, called Nikli, Nikli, her last name, and, uh, and she may have been from Mani. So some people may say, well, you know, how do you come across with that? For those who don't know, Tripoli was made up of three Byzantine towns. That's why it's called Tripoli. And uh -huh. one of them was Nikli. And uh -huh. the Nikleans went into Mani and they control Mani. Just so for some who don't, who may not understand what that's all about. Anyway, thank you all again. And it was great. And we have to do it again because without poetry, there could be no revolution. So we have to start the new poetry, Andrea. Uh -huh. <laughs> because some people say, well, how can we defeat all these people? We need, it's, we need more. Thank you again to everyone who was with us today. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good evening from Athens. Kalinita. Thank you. Thank you. Kalo 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 Kalo